Chapter 19 of Dave Dawson on Guadalcanal by Robert Sidney Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Flight's End Darkness and more darkness and even more darkness, constantly, forever, and eternally. And with it all, the monotonous, nerve-pounding drone of the engine in the nose of the Mitsubishi. Ten million times it was all Dawson could do to refrain from screaming his head off and diving right out of the plane into the black night air. It was the same minutes after minute and hour after hour. It was almost more than Dawson in his condition could bear. And as the night dragged on and on, tiny little fears began to mount up in the Yank air ace. It had been but a few minutes after the three-to-one air scrap when the Southwest Pacific night had arrived with a swoop and a rush, and closed in on all sides. However, as though the gods were favoring those two youths a little, there was no cloud in the night sky. Above and stretching far off to all the horizons was a solid canopy of glittering and winking stars. And so it had been but a simple matter to plot a course south by the stars, allowing for a slight correction either way. And so they had headed south at cruising throttle, and with a solemn, fervent prayer in their hearts that after the seven hours of darkness in that part of the world would come dawn and the definite knowledge that they were within sight of the new Guinea coast. Both realized that then would begin the most difficult part of the long flight. Though MacArthur's troops and planes were hammering hard at the Japs, the devils from the land of the rising sun still held most of New Guinea, and frankly speaking, the two youths could expect more trouble before they set down on the Yank-held base at Port Moresby. However, they had won out so far and against great odds, so there was more than a little joy in their hearts as they went winging south. For a long time they chatted back and forth about this and that, for no other reason than the pleasure of companionship. Eventually, though, they ran out of words, and save for a short sentence now and then, they both remained silent. As far as Dawson was concerned, that was perfectly okay. His chest was on fire, and it hurt him to talk. Also, there were little alarming spells of giddiness that came to him every now and then. He didn't dare say anything to Freddy, because that would just add one more worry to the English youth's stock. So he kept his mouth shut, clamped down hard on the knife-like pains in his chest, and flew doggedly southward, praying for dawn, as he had never prayed in his whole life before. But the darkness dragged on and on, until Dawson was ready to despair of ever seeing a dawn again. A numbness had settled into his left shoulder, except when he moved it. And when he did by accident, he had to shut his teeth tight to stop from crying out from the pain. A cold, clammy sweat formed on his forehead, and the beads kept continually trickling down into his eyes to blur his vision and cause him to imagine he saw all kinds of crazy things that didn't exist at all a split second after he had brushed the sweat from his eyes. Particularly, he was seeing the lights of ships below, or at least certain he was seeing them until he looked again. Of course, every time he saw the lights, he knew perfectly well that any boat in that part of the Southwest Pacific, Yank or Jap, most certainly wouldn't be showing so much as a speck of light at night. However, what he imagined seemed so real that he was constantly sitting up straight and peering down over the right wing or the left. If dawn would only come, if only there would come a thin pale line of light in the east to give him hope, if nothing else, if... I say, old chap, Freddy Farmer's voice cut into his thoughts and prayers, would you mind raising the shade and letting in a bit of light, what? I'm getting blasted fed up with this darkness. 
I swear, we've had a solid week of it, I really do. Me too, pal, Dawson replied, and struggled to keep the suffering out of his voice. It almost seems as if somebody blew out the doggone sun. Boy, if... Hold it. Am I right, or am I right, Freddy? Could that be the first gray streak there to the east, huh? It not only could be, but it is, the English-born air ace shouted happily. Praise be to Allah. In a few moments now, we should be able to get a look at where we are. I'll bet you anything you like that the New Guinea coast is just ahead of us, and that we'll see it soon. No bet, Dave called back. That's one bet I wouldn't want to win. And how? I wouldn't want to win it. As Dawson spoke, the last of a sudden thought came to him, and he caught his breath. The thought was, what if they didn't sight land within an hour or less after dawn? Supposing their drift during the night hours had been double or even triple what they had allowed for, and they were actually lost somewhere above the broad expanse of the southwest Pacific. What if they were lost? and remain lost until the engine in the nose sucked up the last drop of high test and then quit cold. There was a rubber life raft in the MK-11, but Dawson knew in his heart that he would never survive a single day drifting helplessly on the sun-flooded waters. Yesterday, sure, or the day before, but not now. Not during this day that was now dawning. And so please, God, please. The silent prayer remained on Dawson's lips as he watched the pale line of light low down in the east grow broader and brighter until, as though invisible doors in the heavens had been flung open, the light of the new day came rushing westward, driving the shadows of night on ahead of it. In a matter of less than fifteen minutes, the two youths had perfect visibility in all four directions. First, though, they peered southward, and to Dawson it was like receiving a mule's kick in the stomach. Nothing but dawn-tinted water as far as the eye could see. Not a sign of land, not a sign of anything but water, endless rolling swells of it. A great sadness and a great bitterness welled up in him until he could hardly breathe and there was the sting of hot tears at the back of his eyeballs. No land. Not a darn sight of it, he heard himself mumble. And I had hoped, oh gosh, how I had hoped, darn it, there has to be land, or we just can't possibly make Port Moresby, and I can't. He let the rest trail off, and stared bleak-eyed at the limitless stretch of water to the south. He wanted to turn around in the pit, and say something cheerful to Freddy Farmer in the back. Say any old thing that would take the sting out of what his pal must be thinking, too. But somehow he couldn't turn around. Somehow he couldn't even think of anything to say. He felt absolutely powerless to move. It was as though he were a dead man looking out across a dead world. And then suddenly a bunched fist came down on his left shoulder, and he almost fainted from the pain in his chest as Freddy Farmer's wildly shouted words smashed against his eardrums. Dave, look, off there to port. Dave, look, look, old chap, a lot of ships, a carrier task force. It's Jackson's force, Dave Jackson's. There's our task force, Dave. It's a miracle, a blessed miracle. There's the task force. For one brief instant more, Dawson couldn't move. Then he managed to turn his head, but he could see nothing but swimming lights and shadows. The pent-up emotions within him had broken their bonds, and hot tears that he couldn't check filled his eyes and blurred everything. They made him angry at himself and at everything else, and with angry motions he rubbed and brushed the tears from his eyes. And then when he took another look, he saw what Freddy Farmer's sharp eyes had seen first. Far, far off to port, and so low down on the horizon that they looked like no more than a cluster of bugs on the water, were the two carriers, the destroyers, 
and the cruisers and supply ships of Admiral Jackson's task force. Even though the distance was great, he could recognize them for what they really were, and a happiness such as he had never known flooded throughout his entire body. Jackson's force, he heard himself echo weakly, but what the heck, what's it doing over there? That is a night steaming from the search area, or have we been flying in circles all night long? It's, it's like a dream, a mad crazy dream, I... Dave, snap out of it, for heaven's sakes, Freddy's voice cut short, his mumbling. Fly over to them, Dave, fly over to them. That's our task force. Don't you understand, Dave? Sure, sure, Dawson called back, though every word seemed to burn holes in his lungs. I see them, and I'm heading over, just, just taking a couple of minutes out to enjoy life again. Wait, jolly well, wait until you get aboard, the English youth yelled. Maybe you like being in this confounded aircraft, but I don't. Get us over there, quickly. The sooner we give our report to Admiral Jackson, the better it will be for everybody concerned. Man, Dave, just think of it. We found Sasebo's force, and now we found Admiral Jackson's. Imagine that. Yes, imagine that, Dawson mumbled. Has a spell of cold shivers started taking charge of his body, just the way you see it happen in the movies, only... He let the rest die, because the effort cost him too much, and banked the MK-11 around until it was heading full out for the Yank task force far ahead. And then it was he woke up to a fact that had been in the back of his brain for some considerable time. And what woke him up to the truth was a sight of three Davy Grumman Wildcats streaking up off the flight deck of one of the carriers and coming up and around toward them at top speed. Get set to wave and signal those guys somehow, Freddy, he choked out. We're in a Jap plane, you know. Only those guys don't. So stand up and wave or hold your hands up and surrender or something. Navy Wildcat pilots don't take chances. They've learned you can't against the Jap rats. So, for cat's sakes, wave or do any old thing to get them to hold their fire. Here, I'll help you. Dawson started to stand up in his pit of the MK-11. But before he was halfway up, invisible steel claws seemed to tear his chest wide open. And he fell back into the seat gasping and choking for air. And countless... Dancing red and black dots filled his eyes. It seemed years and years before he could get air into his burning lungs and drive the red and black dots away. By then the first of the three wildcats was within shooting range, but Freddy Farmer was standing up straight, waving his arms, pointing at his American uniform, and yelling blue murder at the top of his voice. The leading wildcat, however, came in boring at a terrific speed. And Dawson died a thousand deaths, as he expected with each new split second, to see the leading edges of the Grumman's wings start spitting out, stabbing tongues of flame, and to feel the Wildcat's bullets and air cannon shells smash and pound their way into the MK-11. However, the Wildcat pilot did not open fire. Instead, he went sweeping past the Jap two-seater, staring at it hard. Then he circled around and came tearing up from the other side. As he drew abreast, Freddy Farmer practically fell out of the MK-11 in his frantic efforts to signal the truth to the Yank Navy pilot. Dawson managed to lift his right hand and wave, too. And then the two other wildcats came up and took up position close to the MK-11. And Freddy Farmer promptly went into his dance for their benefit, too. Eventually, the Wildcat pilots either recognized Dawson and Farmer, or else they spotted the Yank Air Force's uniforms that the two youths wore, and could see that at least no Japs were wearing them. Or maybe it was for some other reason. At any rate, the section leader nodded his head, motioned for Freddy Farmer 
to stop trying to throw himself out of the Jap plane and then point it over toward the carrier task force. That was all Dawson and Freddy wanted, and they both nodded vigorously in acknowledgment. Then, with a wildcat on each side and one just behind and a little above, Dawson guided the MK-11 straight for the task force. As he reached the flanking cruisers and destroyers, he saw the countless upturned faces on the decks and also the pom-pom guns and the Chicago pianos, trained dead on the Jap plane. He grinned down at them happily, but just the same, a nervous shiver or two rippled through his burning and pain-filled body. And then, finally, Dawson had the MK-11 banked around and sliding down toward the stern of the Carson as the carrier knocked off knots into the wind. The glide downward was the greatest agony of his life. Huge as the Carson was, the confounded thing seemed to dance and skip around before his eyes. Countless times the landing officer, with a signal flag in each hand, blurred right out of his vision. And once he almost fainted with fright, when he got the cockeyed impression that he was heading the MK-11 straight for the Carson's superstructure. The 1,000 years passed by, however, and the Jap two-seater was down on the flight deck, trundling forward while deck crews hung on to the wingtips. And finally they managed to drag it to a halt. A choking gasp of unbounded relief burst from Dawson's lips, and tears of inexpressible joy made his eyes smart as he caught sight of Colonel Welsh and Admiral Jackson racing across the flight deck toward the Jap plane. Laughing and choking in the same breath, Dawson heaved himself up out of the pit, stepped out on the wing, but missed his footing, and fell sprawling on the wing. He slid off it feet first, so he was standing on the deck when the Colonel and Admiral came up. "'Here we are again, sir,' Dawson cried. Just like a couple of bad pennies, that, that. His tongue seemed to stick in his mouth, and the Carson seemed to spin like a top. Dave, he heard Freddy Farmer scream. Somebody quick, catch him. Here, Dawson steady, he heard Colonel Walsh shout. Good grief, cried a third voice. Look at his chest. Good grief. The man's hit bad. Here, somebody. But Dawson didn't hear any more. The carrier Carson turned upside down and smashed him on the head with its flight deck. Then there was nothing but complete silence and utter darkness. It was a beautiful pink-tinted cloud that was carrying Dawson through a beautiful world filled with soft and soothing music. Never had he felt so rested and so comfortable, so much so that he just couldn't be bothered trying to figure out where he was or what had happened to put him there. Maybe it was heaven. He didn't know, and he didn't care. If it wasn't heaven, then it was certainly the next best thing. Whatever it was suited him perfectly, and he was quite willing to stay where he was indefinitely. However, that was not to be. The pink cloud faded away and became a white bunk in some ship's whitewashed sick bay, and the soft, soothing music faded out and became the quietly coaxing voice of a human being. In other words, he slowly regained consciousness to find himself staring up into the face of Freddy Farmer, and into the face also of Colonel Welsh. And it was the chief of combined U.S. intelligence who was speaking to him. Easy does it, son, the colonel was saying. Try and hang on this time, Dawson. You're all set, son. Everything is fine and dandy. Not a thing to worry about. Just try and relax and be calm, son. That's right, Dave, old thing, Freddy Farmer echoed, with a catch in his voice. Gosh, but it's good to see your eyes really clear. You look fine, really. Feel a fair bit better? What? Dawson blinked, started to mumble a question, and then gasped as complete memory came flooding back into his brain like water over a broken dam. Hey, hey, he got out. What am I doing here? What are you doing here, Freddy? 
Sasebo's task force. Holy smokes, Freddy. Didn't you? Dawson would have said more, but Colonel Welsh gently put a hand over his mouth and shook his head from side to side. Now, now, son, he said with quiet firmness. Try and realize what I'm telling you. Everything is all right, see? That Jap task force is spread all over the ocean, and a good many of its ships sunk, too. Now, try hard, Dawson, and really get a hold of yourself. You've been raving out the complete story of what happened to you and Farmer for two days now. I'm trying to tell you that everything has been taken care of. Everything is fine. Dawson blinked again and again and tried hard to absorb the full meaning of the Colonel's words. But there was one part that just didn't seem possible. Two days, Colonel, he echoed. You mean I've been like this, out cold for two days? Jeepers. That's right, the senior officer said and smiled. Now just relax, and I'll bring you up to date, briefly. You went out cold right after you landed that Jap plane on the Carson. So it was up to Farmer here to explain everything. When he had told the story, we got busy at once. We figured out the course that Sasebo must have followed after you and Farmer took off. Well, our scout bombers found him. We caught him with his planes on the flight deck. Thanks to you and Farmer, we were able to do a good job on him. One of his carriers sunk, and the other two badly damaged. The last scene of one of them, it was on fire. Two troop ships were sunk, and the rest of the force sent flying for bases where they would be safe. In short, we certainly ruined him for a while. By the time his force can put to sea again, there won't be a Jap left on Guadalcanal for him to reinforce. And, by the way, that attack went off according to schedule. The Marines landed, and, as usual, they have the situation in hand. And now you're aboard a cruiser bound for Australia and a good spell in a hospital. Frankly, you haven't any right to be alive, Dawson. Did you know that? And that's definitely true, old thing, Freddy Farmer spoke up. Good grief, Dave. Why didn't you tell me you had been hit? And to think that all during that terrible night, I didn't know a thing about it. You must have suffered somewhat awful. Well, it wasn't very pleasant, Dawson replied in a voice so weak that it surprised him. I knew that I had caught a good one, but it wouldn't have helped any to tell you, Freddy. There weren't any controls in your pit, and we couldn't have changed seats in that crate. So the only thing I could do was to stick it out. But boy, I was sure glad to sit down on that carrier. But hey, how come we bumped into the task force, Colonel? We were trying to go south to Port Moresby and... And you were headed in the right direction, Dawson, the Colonel interrupted with a nod. In another twenty minutes, you would have sighted land. But you ran across us because we had given up the hunt for the Jap forces and had steamed full knots for the Solomons to slug it out as best we could if the Jap force did show up. It, well, maybe we can call it an act of God that you sighted us and gave us the information that we so desperately needed. And what's the matter, Dawson? Colonel Welsh cut himself off short and anxiously asked the last as Dawson groaned and made a face. Matter, Dawson echoed, plenty. One of the best sea and air scraps there's been in the Southwest Pacific. And I, and I slept through the whole thing. While well, doggone it, I... That'll be just about enough out of you, Colonel Wells said, with more sternness in his voice than there was in his eyes. You and Farmer had done your job. And a magnificent job you did too, thank God. It was somebody else's turn to take a crack at the Japs. And, of course, I mean Admiral Jackson's pilots. So stop feeling that you were cheated, you young fire-eater. Farmer here didn't take part in the scrap either, so you've no complaints. In fact, Dawson, you can give thanks for a miracle every night for the rest of your life. Give thanks for this. The colonel paused, slipped a hand into his tunic pocket, and took out a gleaming chunk of metal. And that's just about all it was, 
a gleaming chunk of metal. "'What's that, sir?' Dawson asked. "'All that's left of your pilot wings,' the colonel replied, and twisted the chunk of gleaming metal between his fingers. It was driven by a zero bullet right into your chest, to within a fraction of an inch of puncturing your left lung. Huh, huh, sir, Dawson gasped out. You mean, holy smokes, a second time? The second time, Dawson, Colonel Wells said gravely, and placed the twice bullet-battered pilot wings into their owner's hands. For the second time, they saved your life. Frankly, I'll never tell this story to anybody else, because nobody else would believe it. But it's true. And there you are, a war souvenir you couldn't duplicate, not even if you lived to be a billion. The colonel said some more words, but Dawson was only half listening. He was staring at his bullet-battered wings and living over in memory all those terrible hours when his chest had been filled with searing flame. Then presently his vision blurred, and without realizing it, he slipped off into blissful, contented sleep. And Freddy Farmer and Colonel Welsh smiled down at his peaceful face and slipped silently out of the cruiser's sick bay. End of Chapter 19 Recording by Richard Kilmer Rio Medina, Texas End of Dave Dawson on Guadalcanal by Robert Sidney Bowen